Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, that's for art, and we are nearing the end of this book, Poison Power, by Dr. John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin, The Case Against Poison Power. We are on chapter 13, which is the last chapter. Let me take a look. There's only a few pages left of this chapter. I think we'll finish it to at least a chapter. I am going to read the appendixes because it has a lot of really great, press, great questions. So I'm going to push through with this. It's going to be the last part of this chapter, and uh, uh, I'm a bit tired tonight, so I hope I can read properly. So we're at the end of this journey, and let me take my glasses off so we can read. The title of the chapter is The Ultimate Issue, Conversion or Ecocide, and I believe that they have opted for Ecocide. Preservation of technologist positions. It is equally obvious that we cannot afford the luxury of unemployment or prospective unemployment for technologists or for the labor force which is involved in their technology. For the first group, the technologists and scientists, the prospect of the disappearance of their technology, their careers, their positions is perforce terrifying. Therefore, objectivity in their own assessment of their particular technology is readily buried in a morass of rationalizations and pseudoscience. The second group, the labor force involved, provides an unfortunate lobby to prevent public objective evaluation of the technology and its hazards. We must develop techniques to protect both groups against unemployment and the fear of unemployment. If we are expect them to participate in a constructive redirection of technology where required. Some economists have a tunnel vision view of unemployment as a useful tool in curbing inflation. Anachronistic and inhumane though this may be, the implication is far, far more serious in a technologically based society. Obviously, where position and total career loss threatens, the technologists and backup labor force will opt, overtly and covertly, for continuation of an antisocial enterprise. And they will represent a powerful force to preserve the enterprise by delaying and confusing the hazard issues. Why should we stimulate this behavior, a behavior so human and expected? We propose, therefore, when a technological enterprise needs cessation or redirection, that the technologists and labor force be guaranteed continual employment in the redirection of their particular technology. Again, the classical economists may argue that the expense would be prohibitive. And our answer is that failure to guarantee against position and economic loss will be infinitely more costly for society. Certainly the legal profession has learned very well the difficulty of getting expert witnesses from within technology to testify concerning hazards of their technology. And they hope that somehow this wall of silence can be broken so as to be able to carry forward environmental lawsuits. Such hopes are, broadly, just destined for failure unless the fear motive is removed. And that fear rests in economic and position losses or potential losses. Moreover, it is manifestly ridiculous even to consider unemployment for technologists and scientists, actually for anyone for that matter. There are indeed many important tasks requiring that all our technology, technology, poof, let me read that sentence again. There are indeed many important tasks requiring all of our technological skills and ingenuity. Why waste it? There is little doubt that most technologists can readily be redirected into new areas. The cost of those who perform poorly during the redirection phase would be a small price to pay for the tremendous gains 
achieve by stopping eco-mad endeavors. A small price to pay for the tremendous gains achieved by stopping eco-mad endeavors. And further, technologists realizing that redirection would be expected in their course in the course of their careers would be far less likely to become overly limited in confining their expertise to the minutia of a specific technology. New subtitle, Ego, Prestige, Loss, and Defensiveness. We are all familiar with the expression that nothing succeeds like success. It seems like a homey little statement until one considers carefully some of the implications. And this leads us directly to consider some extremely important issues other than the economic ones in the persistence of, a tech, of technological blunders. We must ask ourselves seriously about the price of failure rather than success. As a culture, we place a high ego premium on being right about what we say, what we do, for essentially all endeavors that are in the public or semi-public domain. It is no secret that scientific academia, some men appear to devote a lifetime of research and publication to proving they were right in their PhD thesis. Who in the industry or technology is unaware, I'm gonna start again. Who in the industry or technology is unaware of the hazard inherent and in having to tell his superior that all is not so rosy in the picture painted last month or last year concerning a specific project. Defensiveness is the obvious result of the high value premium we place upon success. A defensiveness breed tunnel and defensiveness breeds tunnel vision, self deception and rationalization. Anything but objectivity. Why can't we learn to honor and respect honest admission of error, of failure? While this may require nurturing of a subtlety of attitudes, we will fail to learn to change our attitudes at great peril and cost. Exactly. That's exactly where we're at right now. Decisions to go forward in a technological enterprise are not made by bureaus. They are made by corporate, nor are they made by corporations. Decisions are made by men. It is, of course, entirely appropriate to emphasize, emphasize this in our endeavor to impress upon men that they will be held accountable for their decisions. This will certainly help in making captains of industry, governmental decision makers, and technologists exercise more sobriety than otherwise they might. But at the same time, we must absolutely refrain from squeezing men into an escape-proof, irrational ego box. Responsibility, yes, but only if we add sincere appreciation and praise for the ability of a man to admit forthrightly that he has changed his view, that what once looked right now looks foolish. We desperately need to create an atmosphere where a man can proudly admit error. In a vast majority of instances, the error is not the result of negligence, not the result of deceit, not the result of irresponsibility. It is simply the result of the great power of hindsight, especially hindsight buttressed by new evidence and altered circumstances. So we had better see to it that something else can succeed besides success. Time Magazine, December 28, 1970, carried a short article titled, Heresy and Power. The title itself is extremely revealing of our attitudes. Presented in the article is the statement by Charles Luce, chairman of the Consolidated Edison Corporation, that the idea of promoting increased electric power use, representing the wisdom of three years ago, 
is the idiocy of today. Why is that revised why is that revised view of Mr. Luce regarded as heresy? It is rather a profoundly important realization by a leader of industry that his industry's position of yesteryear is no longer compatible with the real world. And therefore, his statement deserves praise and admiration. Are we broadly prepared to provide such praise? Mr. Liu seems inordinately capable of learning and forthrightly stating the new horizons opened up by his self-education. Thus, instead of a totally defensive attitude of the electric utility advertisers and AEC officials who whitewashed the hazards of nuclear power generation because of their commitment thereto, Mr. Liu suggests the highly constructive idea of a tax on electricity bills to provide funds for research and development on new methods of electric power generation compatible with the environment. Since Mr. Luce is so thoroughly familiar with nuclear power, his company participates in nuclear power, we can surmise that he refuses to be brainwashed concerning the absolute wonders of that approach to power generation. How many men can escape the irrational ego box as well as Mr. Luce has? What reception will he receive for his heresy among his electric power colleagues? And that, my friends, is the end of the chapter 13. Let me put my glasses on. Wow, I am so tired tonight. Whew. So we're at the end of this book. That's really the end. There's no more chapters. Check this out. We have this much in appendices. I guess a lot. So I am going to read the appendix. The very first question in the appendix asks about radiation and allowable standards. So I believe that that's a valuable portion. I didn't read it in his last book, but check out all this whole appendices, all these questions that have been asked. So I think it's worth reading. Well, I'm going to keep this short, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Uh, tomorrow is call-in Friday. Let me pull up the number. Ah! Here we go. That's the number. UCY.TV. Call in 718-717-8296. And you, my radio show, is The Age of Fission, is on... Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Friday is call-in Fridays. Please call in, participate. I'd love to hear from some of my YouTube subscribers and uh, have a conversation with you about anything that you want. So put your courage feet on, you guys. And we'll talk to you soon. Ciao.